Hi. Hello. Hi. Look at you. Hi, guys. Oh, I'm super dark. What's going on there? Let me see if I can <laughs> fix that. It's hey, not sorry actually about that the... dark. <laughs> no worries. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, yeah, we're good, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, nice. doing all right. Are you based in Zurich? Uh, no, I'm actually I'm based in Colorado, uh, USA. Oh, okay, yes. I didn't realize. The team is based in Zurich, though, uh, yeah. and I have been for the longest time, basically ever since. We just moved to the US um, uh, almost two years ago now. Oh, that's amazing. How are you finding it? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We've been in... Uh, <clears throat> I've been in New York for the first uh, year of the pandemic, which was not so fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> and then we we moved out here west, which is oh. uh, uh, much closer in terms of uh, geography, much closer to Switzerland. Uh, at least it feels much more similar to Switzerland. Yeah, and that's you and Anna, is it? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, I think we met a few years ago at Encode in London, which is oh, where, I also where I met Duncan actually. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> look at that. Yeah, it's a small world. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and Miriam, you are based in in London or just in the UK in general? In the UK in general, yeah. I actually live in the countryside. I live in Devon in the southwest of England. It's about three hours yep. on the train from London. Very nice. And you're in Sweden, right, Duncan? Yeah, I was in Gothenburg for about eight years. Um, on the west coast and I've just moved down to the south to Helsingborg like in the middle of last year so I'm yep. now just about 20 kilometers from Denmark over the over the Ørsund Strait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you British though? Uh, I am British or... yes you uh, yeah. detect the accent yeah <laughs> yeah no I, I I lived in London for um, five, about five years before I moved here and yeah now I've been in Sweden for a long time yeah. Gotcha yeah. Swedish people have an, a fantastic like English literacy, uh, <laughs> so but I thought that sure. <laughs> that would yeah that would have been uh, all right. No, I'm um, a Brit. Just so you know, um, there are people already trickling in. Somehow it didn't work out with the training session. Normally we can start sort of like a training session for the time up until then. But uh, so Anit and Sammy are already in the webinar. Uh, I hope they don't mind if we keep chatting for a moment and I hope you don't mind uh, <laughs> no, there no, are people already joined um, yeah do a quick sound check uh, just to be to be sure we did one earlier but um I believe that I'm a little bit quieter than Duncan is that right Duncan can you quickly speak up yeah I can just talk at what I think is my normal pace my normal <laughs> volume <laughs> how's that sounding to you it does sound like uh, Miriam you are a little bit quieter uh, I don't know if you can boost your mic a little bit or let yeah, me see if i can reduce issue. mine a little actually that might be a better yeah. way to do it i've actually got mine boosters as far as it will go it's, it's an issue <laughs> with the mic so i need to get a, a preamp to sort that problem out but how about how about now how am i sounding now you sound a bit quieter but in terms Agree. of like relatively to miriam are we about at the same level now yes closer than before for sure um, okay. Also, okay, you both have both so like the the most high fidelity setup that we have ever had in terms of audio. <laughs> so don't worry too much about the quality. It's going to be a big boost anyway for uh, for our meetup. Um, you know, we had everything from. When... Oh, go on. No, we just had everything from basically like Apple headphones to no headphones at all. To so you know, yeah. having having a dedicated mic or at least a headset is already a step up. That's what happens when you invite podcasters to come on your on your meetup. So yeah, <laughs> we have the same mic as well. It's so sad. I have to say, yeah. I bought it second. I copied Duncan's choices on the mic. <laughs> it's good though, you know. Stick with what good works. Mic, yeah. Yeah. Um, should we quickly test slides? If there are slides from your side, yeah, there are sure. slides. So I'm just going to turn on the screen share. So I'll be advancing the slides. Um, so share screen. Share We've screen. got sound on the slides as well, so we should make sure that those that works as well. Yeah. So hang on, I need to expand just a little bit. You're using the default Mac wallpaper, Miriam. What's that about? 
I am lazy. <laughs> good, good answer. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> okay, is that, that looking all right? Uh, so let's try playing a sound. When we tested these earlier, they were a bit loud, so say what you think. It's a Geiger counter. Uh, let's do a, a musical one. Uh, okay, we try this one. How loud is that? That is very loud in comparison to your voices. Uh, right. I mean, you've also selected the jungle version, so that is <laughs> it's the also the most aggressive the one. Presentation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I hope it's not going to blow people's minds. I don't think there's anything that we can actually do about it. I did look into this, but if you know of any way of other than turning the master down, which would also turn me down, if there's yeah. any way of just turning that down. I, I wouldn't know, and I would believe that if anybody knows, then that will be the two of you. <laughs> well, well, hopefully it'll be all right. You know, it's going to be an experience with a little bit of a punch. That's fine. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Okay. So slides are ready. Sound is ready. Anything, I don't know, that I should know. Anything that you feel that you should know before we get started? I don't think so. Nothing from me. Is there anything for you? You look good? I don't think so. No, I'm, uh, I'm all set. All right, sweet. Well, let's give uh, the attendees another couple of minutes to trickle in. We're not even at the official time yet, but there's already a whole bunch in there. Uh, give them some time to uh, roll in and then we can get started officially. Miriam, one thing that you could do is when you play the uh, audio samples, I think there's like a little volume control that you can you have access to on the like the little play interface on the slides. So you could maybe like to tweak some of them down slightly. There is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So it'll be a bit faffy to do it with all of them, but maybe with <laughs> maybe with boom and bust you can do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Or at the very least, warn people. All right, then I think we're at time. Um, plus people have joined in and I think over the course of the next couple of minutes, there will be more people joining in. But I would recommend that we uh, get started officially um, and then take it from there. Uh, I have sort of like short introduction. So if people still uh, are rolling in then that's totally fine, they will be able to see uh, all of your, uh, the, the whole of your presentation basically. All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, in today's meetup, um, Data Visualization Zurich number uh, 24. Um, today, we're talking about loud numbers and the creators behind this data sonification podcast. For the people who are new, to our meetup, uh, just a quick note, Data Visualization Zurich is a nonprofit organization organized by uh, a couple of uh, data visualization enthusiasts at design agencies based in Zurich. Um, we are a space that brings together the people who are interested or involved in data visualization. We try to our best to sort of like share and expand our knowledge and foster relationships across disciplines and organizations uh, as I mentioned today, we're going to hear from Miriam Quick and Duncan Gear about data sonification and their sonification uh, podcast, The Loud Numbers. What is data sonification? You might ask. Um, data sonification is another way of presenting sound. Um, it is uh, presenting data. Excuse me. Uh, instead of 
uh, like data visualization, it does not use the visual channel. Uh, it uses the audio channel to present uh, that data. So instead of visual attributes, it uses uh, auditory attributes like pitch, loudness, or tempo. I will for sure let uh, the experts speak more on the uh, field itself and the work that they have been doing in that field. So who are our speakers? Uh, Miriam Quick holds a PhD in music from the King's College in London. Uh, and she works as a data journalist, as a researcher, as an author to explore novel ways of communicating data. You might have heard the name Miriam Quick in one of our past presentations uh, when we had Stephanie Posovich talk about uh, the work that she has been doing and she has been a repeat collaborator with Miriam. Duncan uh, holds a master's in science in environmental science um, and he works as an information designer specialized in climate and the environment. <clears throat> Duncan is also a generative artist and musician. So you have heard two times the same word, uh, which gives us a very good basis for the work that they've been doing in data sonification. I will step out of the way. I'll also stop my video to give uh, the stage all the way to Miriam and Duncan. Um, again, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And I hand over to your presentation. Thanks, Ben. And thank you very much for having us to speak today. We're always really happy to speak about loud numbers. So uh, as Ben just said, I'm Miriam Quick, and this is Duncan Gear, And we're going to talk about data sonification with loud numbers. That's our podcast and now our studio. So a little bit about us first. So as Ben just said, I'm a data journalist, and I like to explore unusual ways of working with data. I write data stories for the BBC and other publications. I work on DataViz also for clients uh, with creative agencies. I'm also a musician and I co-create data artworks. And I've turned data into everything from charts and graphics and books to necklaces, engraved 12 inch records and of course pieces of music. And then my name is uh, Duncan Gear. Um, I am an information designer and I live in Sweden. Um, I've worked with folks in the past like Information is Beautiful and BBC Science Focus magazine and Wired magazine in the UK and a whole lot of um, climate and environmental nonprofits like uh, Possible and Project Drawdown and Conservation International. Um, I'm also one of the four founders of the very newly launched Elevate DataViz learning community. So I hope that we may have some members here watching this today and uh, Hello to, hello to you especially. <laughs> so I don't have any formal musical training really, um, but I have spent a whole big chunk of my life listening to and making music. And uh, especially over the last couple of years, I've got really into <laughs> modular synthesizers, but mostly I just kind of love exploring new ways of representing data. And so I think it was sort of only natural that I'd start connecting data with my love of music. So we're going to talk a little bit about our work with loud numbers today, but first I'll give you um, a slightly extended intro to data sonification. Um, and we should probably start with a, a kind of a definition. One kind of simple definition is just that data sonification is the presentation of data as sound, um, the auditory equivalent of data visualization. And just like data visualization, sonification can be both seen as an art or as a science. To be kind of a bit more specific about it, um, sonification is usually, you know, communicated as the presentation of data through non-speech audio. So if you kind of like list out a load of numbers in a table, that's uh, with your voice, that's not necessarily a sonification. We don't count speech itself as a form of sonification, even though the sounds of speech can be used in sonifications, you used to create sonifications. Um, using your voice in sonification techniques is a perfectly legitimate thing to do, though it is surprisingly rare given it is the main instrument that we all have access to without anything else. 
Now, sonification is is kind of interesting to to me because it, it sort of has this veneer of novelty often associated with it. It still makes headlines just for being sonification. This is an article from The Guardian last year um, about a couple who were musicians and one of them was pregnant and they attached electrodes to her stomach to record the sounds and the electrical impulses from their baby in the womb and then they released it as an album and this was yeah front page news on on the guardian which was kind of kind of remarkable just because it's it's you know the, the news angle is this is sonification this is interesting just because it's sonification but in actual fact sonification has been around for at least a century probably much more in much more ordinary forms that you might not actually think of as sonification a very classic example of sonification is the Geiger counter. This is an instrument that you'll probably be familiar with, which detects radiation levels. Another very, very commonly heard form of sonification is the kind of heart rate monitor, which you hear in just about every hospital drama that you've ever seen on TV. And then there's also the mobile phone ringtone, especially if you have a custom ringtone for a particular friend or loved one. But it doesn't really stop there. Um, burger alarms, checkout beeps to you know, make sure that the checkout person knows that an item has been scanned. The ding in your car that tells you your seatbelt isn't fastened or irritating voices that tell you that a vehicle is reversing. All of these things are sonifications. Um, and it's kind of interesting that, that we don't think of these as sonifications mostly, but they're still communicating data through the medium of sound. Sonification is really, really good at alerting you to important changes of state in this way, like a loud sound, an alarm, unlike a flashing light, is really hard to ignore, and it's going to reach you even if you happen to be looking in the wrong direction at, at any given time. So sonifications like the ones that we just heard can more precisely be termed as earcons or auditory icons. And these names come from a terminology that was developed by a sonification researcher called Thomas Hamann in 2002. He proposed five different categories of sonification. And we have kind of, when we talk about this, we usually simplify it down into three. So earcons and auditory icons are what we were just talking about. They're short little audio clips that represent events, uh, phone notifications, blips of a barcode scanner. In Hermann's explanation, uh, the difference between these two things is that earcons are abstract pings and bloops, just sort of like bloop, bleep, bleep, while auditory icons sound like the thing they represent. So that might be um, representing a sale by the sound of a cash register or something like that. Um, this can be a really simple and effective way to sonify data, but it doesn't stop there. The second um, form of sonification is audification. And this is when you get a bunch of data or a recording of something and you use time stretching or pitch shifting techniques to get it into a range that can be heard by the human ear. A really good example of this is the Sounds of the Sun, which was published in 2018 by NASA. Um, they took data from their solar and heliospheric observatory satellite, which goes around the sun, and then they just sped that data up by a factor of 42,000 to bring it up to the range of human hearing. And here's a little sample of that. Literally the sound of the sun, but sped up. And then finally, there's um, parameter mapping, which is what most of most data visualization folks think of when they hear the word sonification. And this is when you map data values onto different audio properties, as we were talking about earlier, like pitch or volume or duration or tempo and so on. In the same way that data visualization will map data values onto visual properties like color, shape, size and angle and so on. And this is the approach that we took with loud numbers. And you can kind of put these categories of sonification along a sort of scale of abstraction where audification is closest to the original data. And then parameter mapping involves the most processing to translate data to sound or music. 
So let's talk a little bit more about these different kind of variables that you can influence when you're, when you're working with sonifications. So in 1967, um, the French cartographer Jacques Bertin came up with the idea of visual variables, and he defined them as position, size, shape, brightness, hue, orientation, and texture. In a similar way, we've kind of created a list, it's an incomplete list, of sound parameters that you could map to data. Um, they include things like pitch, loudness, timbre. If you're not familiar with the word timbre, it's sort of talking about the texture of a sound. Um, that can include EQ, which is like how bassy or how trebly it is, um, but also what instruments are playing it. Um, timing is another thing that you can manipulate, which includes note duration, tempo, rhythm, the number of sounds you have in a given time period and much more there. Um, you could also include spatial position, so like the panning field in stereo, um, as well as sound effects like, uh, you know, reverb, distortion. There's, there's all kinds of things that you can do when you start getting into effects. And all of these things can be used to encode and communicate data. And you can also double or triple encode things by using more than one at once. And just like with visualization, that's a really effective way to bring forward um, one particular aspect of your data story. So if you want to kind of create a sonification, um, it's useful to kind of think about what, what styles of data work best, because definitely not all data is suited to sonification work. Time series data works particularly well. We almost always listen to music play out over time, and you can quite easily compress, I don't know, 10 years of data into a five minute track to really bring the changes over that time period to life for a very general audience. Um, this kind of case works best when there's a, a simple consistent pattern in your data or a trend, and the data isn't too noisy. If it kind of spikes up and down a lot, then that can uh, make it more complicated to hear the, the general trend. If you're communicating to a general audience, then keeping the data simple in that way is generally a good idea, but it's not always how sonification is used. It's also used by specialists, um, often astronomers. There's a lot of astronomy sonification and earth scientists to analyze and understand complex or like very multi-dimensional data sets that you couldn't visualize so easily. And then finally, sound can really enhance the emotional qualities of data sets. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit. Um, but if you have data that has a very strong emotional resonance, then sonification is often a good, good option for that. Here is a, a simple sonification of climate change data by the composer Chris Chafe, uh, which brings a really strong emotional dimension to the topic. So this is a sonification of global temperatures and CO2 levels from 1680 to 2016. And the pitch of the steady tone in the background, the quite high one, represents carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, while the pitch and the intensity of the kind of plucked string sound, the dung 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 sound, represents temperature averages over that time. So it starts off fairly muted, and then at about the middle of the 19th century or so, here, you start to hear the pitch of both of those things rise as carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere rise and the planet begins to warm up. And if we skip forward to the late 20th century, things start to go really crazy. You're probably feeling all kinds of things about that right now. And, and it works because the sounds that, have, that Chris has chosen on this, this piece of work are inherently kind of unsettling. It sounds like part of it sounds like a warning siren sort of spiraling out of control. Um, and, and also it's kind of interesting because it gives us a new way of looking at a data set, which is now extremely familiar to all of us. Like if you plotted exactly the same data on a line chart, you wouldn't feel the same way that you just felt while you were hearing it. It wouldn't have the same visceral impact that the, that sound does. So you're probably asking yourselves, how do you make a data sonification? And there are a lot of different tools that you can use. Um, 
if you're looking to just sort of get started and dip a toe into it, then twotone.io is probably our number one recommendation. It's really simple to use. It's a great place to begin. Um, but there's not really one tool that does everything that you need yet. Um, and so a lot of people lean on code-based solutions to try and create their own tools. Um, in JavaScript, you've got the library tone.js, which pairs really nicely with D3 and other like plotting libraries. Um, Sonic Pi is what we use to create loud numbers. Uh, this works in Ruby and it is very, I would say it's probably one of the most approachable code oriented sonification tools for a beginner. It has a really, really good tutorial and it runs on a Raspberry Pi, hence the name Sonic Pi. Um, there are also more kind of traditional sort of sound technology environments like Max MSP, Super Collider, Pure Data. And then there's also sonification packages available for R and Python if you are spe if you specialize in those languages. Other kind of less traditional approaches to sonification include just like writing out your sonification on a stave on paper um, or, you know, doing other kind of things that with with pen and paper. Um, and then there are also other forms of analog sonification. Um, there's a journalist called Simon Huwila who did a fantastic sonification of COVID data on a, a physical music box. That was quite impressive. And there's a, a, another researcher called Jordan Wirfsbrock and she does really, really great work that I call punk sonification where she does um, a lot of stuff with, with her voice and then just like banging things with other things. It's really, really effective and it's very participatory, which is, which is really great. So that's kind of a broad overview of, of sonification in general. Um, I hope all that made sense. And I'm gonna pass over to Miriam now sitting over there to talk about our podcast, which is called Loud Numbers. So at Loud Numbers, it's our podcast, as Duncan just said, and each episode, we turn a different data story into a musical track, and we use sonification techniques to do that. So Loud Numbers actually started as an idea that Duncan had back in 2019, and he pitched to me at a DataViz award ceremony back when we were doing in-person events. Remember those days? He said, I've always wanted to do a data sonification podcast and it doesn't exist yet, so let's make one. And I thought about it for a few days and then I said, yes, yeah, let's do that. So then into the pandemic, early 2020, and we both didn't have as much client work coming in as usual. So we had plenty of time to work on a podcast, which was great. And it was just as well because making sonifications, as we found out, takes absolutely ages. So it really became my lockdown project. I would say Duncan's as well, but he lives in Sweden where they didn't actually have a formal lockdown. So there are lots of different uh, kinds of data sonification, but with loud numbers, we wanted to do something quite specific and very much on the parameter mapping end of the spectrum. So firstly, we really wanted to tell data stories. Uh, these should be stories that are worth telling, that are inherently interesting, and that can be told powerfully through sound. And secondly, we wanted to represent the data accurately. We could transform it to get it in the form we needed, just as you would with a visualization. So for example, we could put it in bins or we could smooth the data. And of course, we selected the time periods that show the most interesting trends and work within the constraints of our track when we're working with time series data. But we never change the raw underlying values. So this is sonification that's based very rigorously on the underlying data set. And finally, we wanted the result to sound good and we wanted it to sound like music and not just kind of random beeps and boops. And we always said that we wanted to create tracks that you would press play on more than once. So by trying to achieve all these three things at the same time, we're really trying to kind of hit this sweet spot in the middle of the Venn diagram where we can balance all these different competing concerns. So there are five episodes in the podcast and they all follow a very similar format. First, we introduce the story and we give some background about where the data came from. Then we explain the sonification system we've used in the music track. We explain how the data is mapped to sound and also what to listen out for. And then finally, all the episodes end with the full music track at the, at the end of the episode. So all these five tracks are in very, very different styles and we really wanted to explore a variety of music genres with this podcast. So the first episode is called The Natural Lottery, 
and it, it turns data on climate change in Alaska into a techno track. The higher the pitch of the chord in the track, the earlier the ice on a particular river in Alaska melted that year. I, I, just to warn you, this might be quite loud, so I'm going to turn it down slightly, but just be warned. 1933. Oops. I've got a kind of gray box in the middle of your presentation. Yeah, there. that's the yeah. Q and A that okay. I was opening. Whoops. <laughs> so that was the first track. The second track is called Tasting Notes. And in this episode, we use data from a beer expert quantifying various aspects of the taste and the aroma of 10 different beers to create 10 jazzy sounds. Now, this is the sound of the Belgian Vit beer. <laughs> The third episode is called Boom and Bust, and in this episode we use data on the US economy since 1968 to dictate the drum pattern in a jungle track. Um, so when the economy grew in the US, the drums play forwards, and when it was in recession, we actually reversed the sample, so it plays backwards. And also listen out for the sample saying, cool down the dance hall when the economy goes into recession. This is quite loud. <laughs> Did you hear it? Did you hear the drums go backwards? So our fourth track is called A Symphony of Bureaucracy, and it maps the number of laws created each year by the European Union and its predecessors uh, since 1952 to the number of voices in a fugue. So a fugue is a kind of musical form where melodies are layered on top of one another and they're transformed in various kind of clever ways which are constrained by very, very strict rules. So in our sonification, as the melodies stack up, so do the laws. And you might recognise the main melody as the official anthem of the EU, which is Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And then we get to the final episode, which is called The End of the Rose. And this turns data from insect decline in Denmark into a mournful music track. And we're going to talk a bit more about how we made this specific track in a moment. <laughs> So those are the five tracks, and I'm going to talk a bit now about how we actually made the podcast. So this is our creative process. It generally looks a bit like this. We always started with the story. So what is an interesting question that we can explore with data? And normally Duncan came up with this original idea. Then Duncan would look for available data sets and share them with me. And at the same time, we'd both think about the, the mood or the sound world that we wanted to create in the sonification. A little bit like um, creating a mood board for a data visualization. And then once we had this data set and some mood cues, often in the form of words or images, we would define the sonification system. And this is where we really started to nail down the specifics, like the number of data layers, the instrument choices, the sound choices, how exactly the data is mapped to sounds, and how data time is compressed into musical time. So we use time series data in all but one of the episodes, and we had to decide, given the length and granularity of our data, and the fact that our tracks needed to be really between about four and 10 minutes long to fit in the podcast format, should one bar of music equal a day, a month, a year, or, or something else? So at this stage, we would produce code sketches in Ruby using Sonic Pi, and then we would gradually refine them until they got to the, the sound that we wanted. Then I would extract the audio from these code sketches and produce a music track from them. And I use Logic, Logic Pro, which is Apple's uh, music software. And I would define the instruments. I would add non-data musical layers as well. 
I would add effects and mix the result down. And sometimes I would construct the data parts from scratch if they sounded better using Logic's instrument set. So not everything is based on code. At the same time, um, Duncan would write the podcast script. He would explain the data story and sonification system used and then introduce the track. Then we've got each track mastered um, using some engineers based in Berlin called Queer Ear. And we recorded the podcast audio using a web-based tool called Zencaster. So we're co-presenters on the podcast, but um, we live in different countries. I live in the UK and Duncan lives in Sweden. So using Zencaster made it easy to record our voices in different places. And then finally, we edited the audio together with a master track and we mixed each episode down in Logic. So that's, that's really an idealized version of what happened. I mean, in reality, we, we spent quite a bit of time sort of refining the system, uh, moving back and forth between the data and the system and the music, this data works, this data doesn't work, trialing lots of different things, getting stuck, trying again, um, in one case, uh, starting from scratch all over again. But I'll hand over to Duncan now to talk about a particular episode, the insects episode, where we did follow this process pretty tightly. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, so let's talk in a little bit more depth about how we put together this specific episode, um, The End of the Road, which is about the decline of insect populations all around the world. Now, I, I work a lot with environmental data, and so this was a subject that was very close to my heart. If you've been paying attention to this subject at all over the last few years, then you might have seen scary news stories about bee colony collapse disorder and so on. But we wanted to know how much have insect populations actually declined in the last few decades. And so I decided to look for some data. And I found it with a quite an interesting story in a paper published in 2019 by a Danish scientist called Anders Pepper Müller. Like a lot of Scandinavians, um, Anders has a summer house out in the countryside, which he visits every summer, and he has been doing this for at least two decades. And while he's there, he drives rental cars, and he often drives along two specific stretches of road. And so, like any good scientist, he started counting the number of insects that smashed into his windscreen after every journey that he made. Between 1997, when he began his survey, and 2017, 20 years later, um, after controlling for factors like weather, time of day, season, and so on, he found an 80% reduction in insect populations at one location and a staggering 97% reduction at another site. Just to be clear about this, for every 100 insects there were in 1997, by 2017, there were three. This data kind of shows us nothing short of a total apocalypse of insect life. So we can show you Muller's data on a line chart where the vertical axis is the total number of insects splattered on his car windscreen each journey, and the horizontal axis is two decades. Um, this is only the summer months when he collected data. And you can see this incredibly clear design from these really, really high peaks in midsummer um, in the early years to nothing today. What's not shown here is that Muller also sorted his insects into two categories, like large insects and small insects, both of which had similar declines. And we wanted people to hear this decline, to kind of make the, the silence of the insects audible. So we sometimes use visual images at the start of the process when we're trying to figure out the mood of our tracks. And here's one that I shared with Miriam when we started working on this track. This is from a video game called Kentucky Route Zero, um, which has this wonderful, magical, realist plot line and, and an amazing soundtrack, and you should definitely play it. But <laughs> for the purposes of our presentation today, this dark scene really captured the atmosphere that I wanted to create with this track. I want it to be the sound of driving through this vast, desolate landscape on a distant highway with insects occasionally hitting your, in, your windscreen. I wanted it to be downbeat and funereal, almost like a requiem for lost biodiversity. So we needed to design a sonification system to represent that. And as I said, we had data for the four summer months, May, June, July, and August. So we decided to map the number of insects um, in each given time period to the number of sounds in a different time period. And in the end, this turned out to be one month per bar. 
This way, the track would kind of empty out and we'd have fewer sounds towards the end as the insects disappeared. But we then had this sort of question, like what sort of sounds should we use? And we started by thinking, well, what, what do insects sound like? Well, they generally kind of make buzzing noises that sort of fluctuate in pitch and loudness. So I wrote some code in Sonic Pi that created a sawtooth oscillator and a square oscillator that slide between random pitches and amplitudes. And I played this to Miriam. It sounded a bit like this. And Miriam's response to this was something kind of a bit like, no, this sounds like a massive scary beetle flying really close to my head. So <laughs> we kind of dropped that one. And then Miriam made her own version with five different saw wave oscillators and pitches that ranged from low to high. You can kind of get a sense of the code on the left-hand side here. Um, I apologize for not writing for loops. We were kind of doing it quickly. Um, the smaller ones move quicker, and so the amplitude and the pitch shift more quickly, and the larger ones are a bit more sluggish. And here's what her version sounded like. And this was still a little bit terrifying and quite honestly, a little bit gross. It kind of sounded like flies circling around something awful. So then I had another go and we, we sort of went back to basics. We, we thought we'd go for something that was a bit more fluttery and ethereal, something that hinted at the idea of insects rather than trying to like generate insect sounds, something that's a bit more abstract. Um, so you can hear this version and the reverby kind of cowbells at the beginning and the end of this excerpt mark the passing of each year. You can think of them a bit like tick marks on an axis. <laughs> So the code for this is a little bit too long to show here, but in a nutshell, these sounds are made using a basic oscillator with a, a tremolo effect applied to it so that they sound a bit more fluttery and chirrupy. Uh, the lower sounds represent insects classified as large in the data set, and the high sounds represent smaller insects. So the next step was to place these sounds in a way where we could kind of control the density of the sound without having to specify exactly where each one went because there were a lot of sounds to place. We built a system in the code where each individual chirrup is placed randomly in each bar, but they're not ever allowed to sit on top of each other. And so the more you cram in, the denser the sound gets. It's a little bit like a, a Geiger counter in that way. The individual sounds that come in are random, but you hear the density of those sounds increase when radiation increases. In our case though, the density, the cacophony of the insect calls decreases over time, leaving empty space behind it. So then we made a basic version of the final track entirely in Sonic Pi, and here's a little chunk of what that sounded like. You'll notice that there's a bunch more sounds there than just the insects, um, as well as the cowbell time axis. There are also, there's this kind of background pulse that we originally were intending to map to some data. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. And there's also a sort of hi-hat rhythm and a bass line going on. Um, and also some sound effects of cars passing in the background, hitting ever fewer insects on their windscreens. In the podcast, like all of our tracks contain a lot of these non-data layers, and we found that this was really, really important in making the track sound like music and create atmosphere and mood and emotion. It's a bit like picking the right font or the right color palette in a data viz. It's not essential, but it, like, it doesn't necessarily communicate data, but it's very important for getting across the tone of what you want to say. And at this point, we also decided to change out the key of the track from C minor to E minor, and we swapped out the bass line for a new one that sounded like this. Mm -hmm. 
Now, shout out to any 13th century music nerds in the audience <laughs> who will almost certainly have noticed that we're using the Dies Irae sequence, which is a set of notes from a medieval Latin poem, which are really strongly associated with funerals and requiems. It's the four notes at the bottom here. Um, this kind of like, da, 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 dum. And film fans also might rec recognize this sequence because it's featured in loads of soundtracks for movies like The Shining, uh, The Clockwork Orange. It also features in parts of soundtracks of other films where there's this kind of need to convey mortal danger of some sort. It's in Jurassic Park, it's in Home Alone, it's in Star Wars, it's in uh, It's a Wonderful Life, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Batman Returns, and it's even in Disney's The Lion King. And I think we have a little clip we can show you of, of Dies Irae in The Lion King. Kill him. Do you hear that in the background? That da, 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 da. That's Dies Irae. It pops up everywhere. And now we've told you about it. You're going to hear it everywhere. It's like the FedEx arrow thing. <laughs> Um, all right, I think I'm passing over to you now, Miriam, right? Oh no, we've got more Lion King. Right. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, at this point, we, we really felt that the track needed a second data layer along with the data from Muller's paper on insect decline. So we found another paper uh, that was published in Science in 2020 that showed a 1.1% annual decline in global land-based in insect populations as opposed to those just in, in those two stretches of road in Denmark. So that actually means that 11% of insect populations around the world are disappearing each decade, which is a truly shocking statistic, I think. And we sonified this second data layer in a very simple way. We simply put the data in bins so that every time global insect numbers fall by 5%, the melody drops down a note. I basically needed the melody to descend an interval of a fifth, that's five notes, over the course of the track to work musically. So I, I chose this 5% threshold to create five bins, which is a little bit of a case of putting the music before the data, if you like. So working in Logic, I selected a kind of eerie synth sound for this, and it's got a sort of desolate twang, which is quite a uh, lost highway. <laughs> So just to recap, in the final track, we've got two different data sets on insect decline that are sonified. We've got the Danish one in the foreground, and then we've got this global one in the background. Final track uh, turned out just under five minutes long. The elements that I added or changed at this stage, where I, I dropped the tempo a little bit, it's 85 beats a minute. This felt a little bit more, more appropriate than more funeral temp funereal tempo. I changed the hi-hat pattern. Um, from this, I did, uh, there's no copyright lawyers here, nicked the drum rhythm from a track by Joy Division called Atrocity Exhibition, which fans will know is the first track on their 1980 album, Closer. It's a fantastic rhythm and it's incredibly, yeah, go and listen to the track Atrocity Exhibition. I improved most of the sounds. I spent quite a bit of time, again, using the Joy Division um, inspiration to try and get a bass sound that sounded a lot like Peter Hook, their bassist. Didn't really get there, but it was a fun exercise. I improved the hats. I swapped out that cowbell that we had before for a tubular bell that sounds a bit more like a funeral bell tolly. I added some chimes so that you hear these chimes sweep every time the global insect's note drops down one. So it's really sort of emphasizing these changes in the data. I added sound effects. I added reverb and pan to create this sense of spaciousness and expansiveness and kind of epic vistas. I added some ambient sounds at the beginning and end. So we've got uh, the sound of a, a field, basically rural ambience with twittering birds. We've got some crows cawing uh, and it just gives it a sense of being out in the countryside and also that sense of like landscape horror, you know, crows flying up to the abbey at the beginning of the movie, that sort of thing. I, I mix it down and then uh, the mastering engineers at Query in Berlin did the final master. So that's what we did, and this is what it sounds like. And I'm just going to play a one minute excerpt from the beginning of the track. Um, so this is before most of the insects disappeared. And you can listen to the full version of all our tracks on the podcast, of course. And you can also listen on Spotify. <laughs> Thank you. 
So just to finish off, here are a few things that we've learned so far when creating sonifications. The first one is really to start simple. And this is something that we got quite wrong initially. We made these very complicated sonifications where we tried to map absolutely all the data that we could find to, to music. And then we realized this is just too complicated. We stripped it back down to just one or two data layers initially. And of those, there's always one that's that's kind of the most important. You know, it's the, it's the main story, the one with the clearest message or trend. Um, I think this is especially the case if you're just starting out with sonification. And also for the sake of the listener, that it gets a lot harder to hear changes in the data the more sound layers there are stacked on top of one another. And your listener also has to keep more things in their head at the same time. You know, if you think of explaining the system before listening to the track. So keep it simple as a really good uh, rule of thumb. And we think that this track that uh, I just played, End of the Road, we think it works quite well because the texture is quite sparse. There's only two data carrying musical parts. And it, of course, becomes even sparser as the insects vanish. The second thing we've learned is set the tone. So really think about the story that you want to tell and the sound world that you want to create if you're, if you're doing these kinds of musical sonifications. And the instruments that you choose, of course, create the mood of your track. So don't just use MIDI piano for absolutely everything because it's, for example, it's the default on two-tone, for example. Um, think about which kinds of instruments best communicate the mood that you want. So that could be a funeral bell, it could be soft strings, it could be space age synths, or it could be an air horn like we used in the track about the US economy. And then thirdly, just experiment. So when it comes to mapping data to sounds, don't feel that you have to use pitch. You can also use loudness, you can use the number of sounds in a time period, you can use stereo pan, you can even use tempo, although the results can be quite unsettling, but it's, it's a powerful effect. And sometimes it takes some time and a lot of tri trial and error to reach the best possible mapping. And a lot of the, the success or the failure of a sonification, I think, lies in exactly how the data is mapped to sound. So it's generally a good idea to test the ranges, the, the range extremes, uh, to test how the minimum and maximum values in your data set will sound first, and then calibrate the scale through a pest, repeated testing and tweaking until it really communicates the nuances you want. And I think it's a lot like choosing a color scale for a map. You want to try lots of different versions until it shows the right, the right uh, patterns for your story. So back to this Venn again, um, there can be some quite tricky trade-offs to be made if you want to do all these things, to tell a strong story, to keep the data, data truthful and accurate, and to make the results sound good. But we think it's really fun to explore this space and to aim for that sweet spot in the middle of the Venn in which they can all kind of bounce off and enhance each other. Um, we hope that you think we succeeded and we definitely think it was worth the effort. So that was the podcast. Uh, so what's next for us in 2022? Well, we're launching a sonification studio, a loud number studio, um, because since releasing the podcast, we've found that there is quite a lot of demand for commercial sonification work. And we've already done some projects. Uh, we were sonifying sales data for Walmart. Then Duncan has worked on some artwork sonifying, co sonifying COVID data for the Museum of London and Brighton Digital Festival, as well as creating um, a sonic piece about prime numbers for a university in the Netherlands. So we've decided to set up the Loud Numbers Studio and we'd love to talk to anyone who's interested in learning more about the interaction between sound and data. We can offer sonification workshops, consultancy, and of course, commissions. So get in touch with us at loudnumbers.net. And finally, if you're just interested in sonification, then do get involved. There's a sizable community out there. There's some really good resources for getting started out there. Um, you can sign up to our mailing list at loud, loudnumbers.net if you want to hear more about the community initiatives that we're planning for this year. Um, that includes a home for the sonification community online, another Loud Numbers sonification festival um, after the one that we did last June, and also a remix album from the podcast. So that's it, I think, from us, and I really look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. Thank you so much, Duncan. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, thanks for walking us through it. There are a, a couple of questions. Um, so let's uh, jump right in and get started, uh, see if we can get answers to uh, people in the audience. Um, if you want, you can also read the questions um, in the, uh, if you click on the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, but I will read it for you. 
Uh, Christoph asks, uh, I have the feeling that most of the data that are used for certification are time series or data with few variables, including uh, a time component. How would that work with, uh -huh. probably let's say a household survey with many observations and variables. So maybe you could speak a little bit about time series being important and multi-dimensionality or sort of like many different attributes and observations, how could that be handled? Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, as we said before, time series is, is very much the easiest way in when it comes to sonification, but that doesn't mean other things are impossible. In our tasting notes episode, we sonify different categories by creating a little kind of like musical piece, a short musical piece that plays out over you know, 10 to 30 seconds or something like that for each one. And then the tone of that is different. It's almost like creating a little kind of, it's it's a bit like a glyph really um, for, for each of the beers. So it is kind of possible to do categorical data. Do, do you have anything you want to add to that, Miriam? Yeah, um, I just... I just want to say that yeah time series data is often used for for obvious reasons and i'm trying to think of some exceptions to the rule other than the beer sonification that that you just mentioned duncan and uh one of our inspirations for that beer sonification was actually a sonification of the uh, chemical profile of red wine um which uh, is not time series because it, it simply it's I like an audification of a graph uh it simply sonifies the distribution with the lower notes towards the left hand of, of, the, of the chart, if you like, of the area chart and the higher notes towards the right. Um, for me, it's a very interesting experiment, but it's not necessarily a very intuitive way of, of accessing, of, uh, of processing that data, but I, I like the project. Um, I'm, where do I post the link? I'll post it in the chat. I mean, Robert in the chat is describing it a bit like audio churn off faces. And yeah, I would say it's a bit like that. And it comes with a lot of the same um, drawbacks that churn off faces have. So, yeah. yeah absolutely. Thank you so much. Good. Um, Sarah Reed asks a, a more technical question. Um, you mentioned that you work a lot with, um, with Sonic Pi. Um, she asks uh, how easily um, could basically the the level of fidelity that you have achieved, how easily could that be um, produced with the, uh, the standard tool two-tone? .io. Impossible. <laughs> that's, that, that's the quick answer. Um, I mean, so, so this is kind of an interesting thing about sonification. And I think it's part of the reason why not, why more visualization people haven't got involved in it. And it's because there's this kind of like weird middle gap where like, it's really easy to create super basic stuff in two-tone. And if you know code, then you can do incredibly complicated stuff, but there's no middle ground in the middle there. And so, you know, we're talking to a few people about this, and this is a problem that we think really needs to be solved. Um, you know, there's definitely nothing, we haven't started work on anything like that. So it's still quite a way away if anything does happen. But yeah, if this is a problem you want to solve, then please go ahead and do it. There is a, definitely a gap in the market for that middle ground. So in two-tone, um, you can basically map things to pitch only, and you can select your instrument. Um, I believe that's the, yeah, you can you can change the number of notes and the, num the number of rows in your data set. Um, but I think that's the only way in which you can customize them. So you, you certainly couldn't uh, use loudness as a mapping, for example, or the number of sounds in a time period. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Um, we have a very detailed question up next. Um, so when we talk about visual variables, um, there's oftentimes a fairly quick decision on which ones are the strongest. There have even been ranking for like position being the strongest, for example, like the easiest discernible. Uh, and Matteo asks, is there an equivalent of which types of data attributes could or should be encoded with which types of uh, audio attributes? Well, I think that's a really good question. Um, probably better answered by son sonification researchers than us. Um, but I I'm noticing reading down the question a little bit, um, he has written, is pitch the best sonic variable to use? And if yes, how to deal with the fact that frequency is inversely proportional to the size of a physical object, such as the instrument that can produce that sound. I think that is a super important point. Pitch is actually quite 
it's a very precise um, way of mapping and that we can hear small pitch differences relatively easily compared to loudness differences, for example. Um, but it's also an ambiguous one. So a louder, sorry, a higher sound in pitch, it can mean more or it can mean less, because if you think a smaller instrument makes a higher sound and a larger instrument makes a lower sound. And apparently I was reading a paper the other day called Is Sonification Doomed to Fail? Which <laughs> is a good read, I recommend it. It's uh, published in 2019 and in ICAD, in the ICAD conference, um, where the author cites this problem and says that in experiments, roughly half of listeners associate increasing of as in pitches getting higher with larger quantities and half associate them with smaller quantities so I think there are definitely obstacles to be overcome here um perhaps that's a good use... reason not to use pitch <laughs> it's a reason not to use pitch but then pitch is also incredibly useful so there is that yeah. sort of tension there um I think pitch is because it is more precise it is one of the more useful um parameters Loudness has a very, very visceral impact, but is less precise. And of course, will depend on things like the volume level of the, of the uh, playback device, or it will depend on you know, compression. We had a bit of discussion with the mastering engineers about compression because we have used loudness quite a lot in the podcast. And I've said to them, for example, you, you absolutely cannot mess with the loudness here because you know, it communicates data. And they were like, okay, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> Because <laughs> that like tweaking loudness so it sounds good is basically their job. So I was kind of telling them they couldn't do their job, but they cope with it really, really well. Um, yeah, basically they all have different strengths and and drawbacks. Uh, but I think pitch is one of the more precise, and loudness is less precise. Timbre probably less precise. Yeah, less precise too. Um, I couldn't point you to any research, but I bet there's some out there. Good. All right, then let's see. Uh, uh, Matteo, I hope you will find it if you didn't get your answer already uh, right here. Um, Sophia asks, um, first, she appreciates the presentation, but then she goes on um, to ask if you have um, seen or heard uh, data sonification being applied in other media, for example, as a soundtrack for a documentary or in commercial campaigns outside uh, maybe the research and the experimental. Well, we were examples. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's that, the, yeah, there's the Walmart one that we, that we worked on, which was um, presented at a, at a, at a conference, but it wasn't presented as a, I'm, I'm not actually sure exactly how it was presented, but it was kind of the soundtrack for an animation that was, you know, just talking about sales data in a particular category. Um, I think other examples might include the work that James Murphy did. Um, so James Murphy is a musician based in New York, who some of you might know as the, um, the originator of a band called LCD Sound System. They are very good. You should also listen to them. Uh, but he did a project with IBM and Wimbledon where he created sonifications of tennis matches. And then that was used in a, you know, basically as marketing for IBM. Um, so yeah, I mean, sonification definitely exists in the wider world, but, and, and, and of course, you know, as I was saying at the start of the presentation, you hear all kinds of sonification all the time. It's just not necessarily parameter mapping sonification. So yeah, that's something to think about too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Max asks, um, he would love to hear more about the process for determining the encodings. We've, and you've touched on, on it already. Um, so he speculates uh, if it's sort of like a mixture between intuition, trial and error, or are there sort of like, is there hard science to sort of like guide those decisions? Take either approach really, right, Miriam? Yeah, uh, we certainly use the mixture of intuition and trial and error. That's exactly what we did. Um, personally, it wasn't based on any anything other than a shaky memory of studying music psychology about 15 years ago. Um, that, yeah, not really any scientific research. How about you, Duncan? Yeah, I think so. I mean. A lot of our decision making was less about, you know, what is going to convey this in the most perceptually accurate way and more what is going to resonate with people in terms of getting our story across. And so we were often paying more attention to things like mood and tone and, you know, those sorts of things than 
you know, exactly being able to hear small changes in, in frequency and, and things like that. So we definitely kind of came at it from much more of a storytelling point of view and less of a, you know, idealized information communication point of view. Yeah. Good. Uh, Sekar is building up basically on, on just this answer here. He asks, um, and he makes sort of like the, the parallel or the comparison between the work that you've been doing, which is oftentimes very rhythmic. Like, again, you're creating music out of it. And he contrasts that to Chris Chafe's uh, work, who's interesting to listen to and does sort of like, uh, or is a representation of, of data, but it's it's it doesn't have an identifiable rhythm or, or tonality. And if you could speak on the trade-offs between these two approaches, maybe in terms of accuracy of representing the data, but also maybe in terms of sort of like reaching and engaging an audience. Um, yeah, just to answer this one first, I think the, I think that because our podcast tracks are so they they have such clear genre reference points you know one is a jungle track one is a techno track uh, one is a kind of joy division style track they're all very um established musical genres this placed an additional layer of constraint on us when we were composing them um and a way which we had to you know this is the sound good bit of the ven they had to both be accurate and sound good so particularly when it comes to things like structural con constraints um these were interesting challenges to work around things like what will be the meter of this uh at what point will we reach the high point where lots and lots of instruments are playing at the same time how will it end how will it begin and how will we make these musically satisfying to listen to um yeah the are, are trade-offs to be made for sure um and i've not tried doing more abstract um, types of sonification where one perhaps might be freer to let the data, I don't want to say speak for itself because it never does that, but to let the data determine the structure of the outcome more, I would be very interested to explore that. And, you know, you, you can think of, I know Duncan, you've done a lot of work with ambient music. Yeah. Can well, sh should really I talk well. about London under the microscope here a little bit? Because I think that's probably a good example where there's no identifiable rhythm at all. Um, this is a project I did with Valentina de Filippo, um, and it was sonifying COVID data over time. And it's done just by the rising of and falling of several different oscillators at the same time that are playing different notes. And so these oscillators are kind of tuned to different notes of a chord, but different parts of the chord, different notes in that chord are louder or quieter at different times, depending on the number of, of um, cases associated with that variant. They're, they're each, each note represents a different variant. And so near the start of the track, you hear one you know, variant kind of very prominently, but over time it sort of shifts and it shifts in a very sort of smooth and gradual way, not in a way where there's like these, it doesn't step really at all. Um, just because you know we have very high resolution data, we have daily data on that. And so, yeah, I think that's a nice example of a piece which yeah, doesn't have identifiable rhythm. It very much has identifiable tonality um, because you know we've, we've set it to the notes in a chord, but it's one where the data very much provides the large scale structure in the track, not any genre concerns. Like in our techno track, for example, where we needed to have you know a four four beat like constantly all the way through. Miriam, you you originally wanted to do a kind of crazy six eight thing, didn't you? And I was like, no no no, we can't do that. I want people to dance to this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and and yeah, and, and at the end, you know, we had to have like a big period where you can mix into the next track because that's a feature of the techno genre, you know. And so without that stuff, which which has no data in it, it wouldn't have been a techno track. So yeah, I, uh, maybe that answers your question. I hope so. I hope so. I think so. Um, unfortunately, we have to cut it a little bit short on the on the Q and A. Um, so, uh, sorry, I'm I talking too much. To... <laughs> no, 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 no. I think because it's too many questions. Um, so, uh, if people would like to follow up with you, um, maybe quickly plug like where could they uh, follow up with you? Where can they follow up with your work? Um, loudnumbers.net um yeah sign up for the mailing list there we're going to be a bit like the mailing list for loud numbers has been very quiet for the last 
few months since we kind of re finished releasing the podcast. Um, but this year, we're going to kind of resurrect it again and talk a bit more about from a community point of view about bringing people together. And because there's just there's nowhere online where people can gather and talk sonification, really. And we want to kind of try and convene that community in one place. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, should, should, should I try and give like ultra quick answers to the, the last four questions? I think I can. Yeah. All right. All right. Let's do Chase it. Dawson. Any music theory resources you can point to that would help you with the musicality of your pieces? Miriam, top recommendations for music theory. Oh gosh. Uh, there's a really great uh, YouTube, it's an old BBC series called Howard Goodall's Big Bangs, which is worth a watch and is a really clear explanation of lots of the basics of music theory. Next question, Christophe Bonton. Is there an attempt to have a grammar of sonification similar to a grammar of graphics that would help sonification literacy? Agree, that would be awesome. I would love to see that exist. I, I I don't know if there's an attempt to make one. I think probably researchers have had a go, but um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. Robert Monfera, are you interested in seeing data sonification for better accessibility of data exploration and presentation tools? Yeah, um, accessibility is something that often comes up around sonification. It wasn't really a specific focus of our project, but it is really, really powerful introducing sonification elements to visual pieces already. I think that's a really, really good thing that you can do um, for accessibility. And then lastly, could you recommend some more places to find out more examples of different sonifications as well as loud numbers? Yes, the data sonification archive is amazing. Um, what is the website, Miriam? Can you, do you know what it Sonification is? Sonification.design. Thank you, Brilliant. yes. Thank you. Data sonification archive, really, really good. They are fantastic folks. Yep. All right, wonderful. So to wrap up, um, two quick notes. Uh, one note is the Outlier Conference, the conference organized by the Data Visualization Society is coming up on February 4th and 5th. Um, Duncan and Miriam will be there and talk, I think, some more about data sonification. We're not, we're not giving a kind of speech. We're not giving a talk. We gave a talk last year, but we will be hosting an unconference discussion. And there are two fantastic sonification talks, one from Sarah Lenzi and Paolo, what's his last name, Miriam? Thank you. And also one from Max Grays and Jordan Werfsbrock, who I mentioned earlier. So definitely check those out. It's going to be amazing. And it's very cheap Perfect. to attend. Perfect. So Paolo and, and uh, Sarah are the creators of the uh, sonification archive. So uh, it's probably a great place to, to follow up on that. Second note is our next meetup, um, which will be towards the end of February. The concrete date will follow up on meetup.com. Um, we're gonna have a practical process oriented uh, presentation by Anna Wiederkehr. She's vis a senior visual journalist at 538. Uh, and she will talk about uh, sketching, drafting, and iterations as part of the data visualization design process. Not looking at iterations as a bummer and as a drag, but looking at it iterations as sort of like a crucial element to achieving a better result than the first best idea. Um, uh, it's probably best to be uh, check us out on meetup.com slash database uh, and you will see the event live as soon as it gets live. Um, so as always, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, big special thank you to Duncan and Miriam uh, for the presentation. That was extremely insightful. Um, uh, if you have any questions or concerns uh, about the Meetup group, then please just reach out uh, either on Twitter, on Instagram, or on Meetup. Um, and with that, I thank everybody for being here today and talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>